Seventh grade. I'm in my backyard here in Chino Hills, uh, not too far from my dear neighbor Sebastian's house. In fact, I'm looking over my fence here and I think I can see Sebastian's house from here. I'm waving. Sebastian, if you can see me, wave back. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> oh, I, don't, I don't know if you can see me or not. Um, but today we are going to be talking about uh, the end of section one. Well, we already talked about no drama, but I want to talk about Japanese art and architecture because we haven't covered that yet. And then we're going to also talk about um, <clears throat> general stuff about Buddhism in Japan. Uh, oh, before I get just a second, it oh, looks like somebody's messaging me on Google Classroom. Oh, it's Sebastian. Let me see what he says. Uh, Dear Mr. Bruce, was wondering if you could help a brother out with some pickup line tips for the ladies. Oh, well, I'd be glad to do that, Sebastian. You know, the coronavirus time isn't a very good time to go around using pickup lines, but I guess I could give you a few tips if you want. Um, <clears throat> let's see, how about this one? If COVID-19 doesn't take you out, can I? That one's pretty good. Or how about this one? Hey, baby, you out of toilet paper? Because if you are, I could be your Prince Charmin. <laughs> or how about this last one? You can't spell virus without you and I. All right. Hopefully that's helpful to you, Sebastian. Good luck with the ladies. All right. <clears throat> so Japanese art and architecture. This is in section one. So remember, one of the main ideas in chapter 13 is that during Japan's uh, cultural flowering, their golden age, they start to move away from Chinese influence and uh, start to develop their own distinctive Japanese art forms and other uh, forms of culture. So this is true of art and architecture. Uh, Japanese artists and architects used a lot of styles that came from China, um, but even though they were getting things from China, as they start to distance themselves away from Chinese influence, they start to be more unique and creative in developing their own unique form of Japanese art forms based on like a Chinese foundation, All right? So... Uh, Buddhist monasteries are places where you're going to see a lot of artistic development in Japan during this time. So this, you know, the walls of Buddhist monasteries are like canvases for painters and sculptors to create statues and images of the Buddha. Um, Japanese scroll painting also became very popular at this time. Um, there's a scroll painting technique called Yamato-e, which is kind of like a fancy comic book. Uh, it's a way of telling stories with pictures and words on a scroll, on a big scroll that you would unroll. Um, homes uh, were also places where we see Chinese artistic influence that becomes more Japanese over time. So some parts of Japan, in the South especially, uh, can be quite warm. They can be tropical. Uh, in climate. And so Japanese architects start to create removable walls in the palaces and homes that they would design. So if there's like a nice breeze coming through, you could like fully remove an entire wall of your home. And in order to do that, of course, the walls have to be very light. So they often use like a paper like substance for the walls. Um, there's also a lot of uh, Asian gardens that start to be used in some of these wealthier homes in Japan. So when we went to the Huntington Library, we saw the Asian gardens there. We can kind of see the general style that would have been used uh, in both China and Japan. A lot of these gardens have tea houses. So some of you might remember the tea house there. We didn't visit it, but we, we walked by it and we, we could see it. All right. Um, now what about Buddhism? So Buddhism comes to Japan through Korea. So remember back in seventh grade, remember Buddhism originates in India, and then it spreads from India to China. And then from China, it spreads out to a bunch of other places. It goes to like Vietnam and Indonesia and Nepal, but it also goes up north to what we would call Mongolia and also 
uh, Korea, right? And so by the time that Buddhism reaches Japan, it's been filtered through all these different languages and cultures, and it finally goes through Korea before it enters Japan. Well, um, Buddhism kind of has a mixed reception when it first gets to Japan. Um, there's a lot of people who like it because Buddhism, unlike the Shinto religion, answers life's biggest questions like what happens after death. Remember in Buddhism, they believe that um, there's a cycle of death and rebirth governed by karma and that reincarnation is possible or reincarnation is what happens after death. Think about how that would be relevant for samurai, for example. Take a moment and think about why do you think a samurai would be particular interested, particularly interested in the idea of reincarnation. Right. It's kind of an interesting topic to think about. Um, what else? Oh yes, I said it had a mixed reception. So that's kind of why Buddhism is popular. But one reason Buddha, Buddhism is not popular is because a lot of Buddhists are very attached to the kami, the local Shinto gods. And they are fearful that if they adopt Buddhism, this is going to offend their kami. It's going to offend their Shinto gods. Um, so while Buddhism is being introduced to Japan, it's infiltrating their culture. Buddhist temples and monasteries are being built. But a lot of Shinto supporters are being very resistant to Buddhism. And at one point, um, a plague broke out right after a big Japanese Buddhist temple was built. And so a bunch of Shinto thought this was the kami punishing Japan for embracing Buddhism. And so uh, they tore down the temple and they threw the statue of Buddha into a canal or a river or something. And then they burned the rest of the temple to the ground. Right? But despite hiccups like this, uh, Japan starts to slowly embrace uh, Buddhist belief especially because members of the Japanese noble class are particularly intrigued by the ideas of reincarnation, right? Remember in the last video, I said one of my personal opinions about the Japanese noble class is they had too much time on their hands. And on the one hand, this is good because it led to a lot of cultural and artistic achievements. But on another hand, it is bad because it seems like they're kind of just looking for something to do. And, um, one of the things that they did is they started to think, oh, well, maybe I'm immortal. Maybe you know, reincarnation is something that's going to happen. All right. So remember, Buddhism teaches that people are stuck in this endless cycle of death and rebirth. And this is supposed to be not appealing to people. But when it first moves into these new cultures, people wrongly view this as a form of immortality. Now, Buddhism teaches that the only way to escape this cycle of death and rebirth is through achieving enlightenment. Right? Uh, and then it also provides the possibility of attaining nirvana, which, remember, from seventh grade is kind of like a, a state of perfect bliss and happiness, although it's not at all like the Christian idea of heaven. So don't, don't compare those two. They're very, very different from each other. Uh, so Prince Shotoku and a lot of nobles support Buddhism. And so Buddhist monasteries start popping up all over Japan. And then there's another emperor who comes later named Emperor Shomu. And he builds a huge Buddhist temple at Nara. Um, and he puts a huge bronze statue of the Buddha in this. Right. So this is one reason that the Buddhist monasteries become so powerful in Nara. And remember, they have to move capitals because of it. So they move capitals from Nara to Kyoto. Um, so this, this temple is huge, and the cost of building it almost bankrupted Japan. And still today, it's still the world's largest wooden building. Right? So it's a huge artistic achievement. Um, Prince Shomu also orders that uh, each of the Japanese provinces have to build a temple and a home for Buddhist nuns to stay in. Right? So Shomu and Shotoku are both big supporters of Buddhism. Um, Buddhism doesn't completely replace Shinto, though. A lot of nobles who are used to practicing certain aspects of Shinto decide to keep it. 
So you have, remember I said we kind of have a unique form of Japanese Buddhism. Part of the reason it's so unique is because it blends together with the pre-existing Shinto religion. So Shinto never fully disappears, right? People continue to believe in the kami. People continue to practice Shinto practices. They continue to have Shinto festivals. Um, but Buddhism does kind of overtake all of it. Remember, Buddhism is a very flexible religion. So Buddhism doesn't really have a problem with people hanging on to their Shinto release, beliefs. So this is, this is another reason that that Buddhism fits in kind of well with Japan. It, it kind of fills in the cracks that, that Japanese people see with the Shinto religion. Um, and then next time we're going to talk about the fact that several different Buddhist sects develop in Japan. That's S-E-C-T-S, not the other word. Um, so several different forms or sects of Buddhism uh, are developing in different parts of Japan. And so we're going to go through those various sects in the next video. All right. Bye, Sebastian. I hope, I hope my tips were helpful. See you later, neighbor.